everyone. And my name is Alejandra Leora Adler. Alejandra comes from my Latin life. I spent 32 years in Mexico and Latin America. And Leora comes from my Jewish family tradition. And Adler comes from the eagle that can fly all through the sky, soar, see the whole broad picture, but can zoom down and get down to the details. So I trust that I will uh, be able to perform some of those three functions in doing this work that we're doing. And I'm here to uh, share with you a new startup. Uh, it's a regenerative enterprise, and it's called Cambia Drawdown by Design. Some of you read Paul Hawkins' Drawdown book? No, about that one? Okay, so we're in the coming attractions. We didn't even make it into the, the solutions part because we're so cutting edge. But we'll tell you more about that, and you'll see for yourself and decide what you think about this. And why regenerative enterprise? Uh, I want to address that because a lot of people in our fields think that if you're not a nonprofit or you're not a co-op or whatever, you're somehow in the bad guys. You know, you're like in the corporate world, and we're not that. Uh, we do believe that it's important. Uh, financial capital is going to be around for a while. You know, we're getting ready to make substitutions and make changes in our economic systems. Can you can you hear me? Uh, everybody here? Okay. Okay. Um, we're, maybe we can close that door, yeah? Okay. Um, we're, we need to make changes in our economic systems. I think we could all agree with that. On the other hand, financial capital is going to be around probably for a while. And it's important to have that movement of financial capital come also into the work that we're doing. And part of the way that we can do that is through regenerative eco-social enterprises. And so that's why we decided to make Cambia, draw down by design, an eco-social enterprise so that it will be able to generate financial capital which can be spread around and we can still have co-ops and all kinds of other forms, B Corps and so on, attached to that. But I just wanted to explain that because for some people they hear the word enterprise and they think business, no. Okay. So the Cambia solution, that's what we've been calling this, and what it is is a solution that uh, addresses how almonds, uh, almonds as we say in the Cape Hay Valley, you know the Cape Hay Valley, any of you been up there? Beautiful place. And anyway, any of you know why they say almonds in the Cape Hay Valley? That's right, when you shake the trees to harvest, you knock the L out of them, so they call them almonds. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say almonds. My husband's English, so he likes to pronounce everything very proper, right? Okay, so it addresses how almonds should be grown, how they ought to be grown in California, and how we can create a living, fungal-rich soil worldwide, while at the same time providing regenerative livelihoods, right? Everybody needs to make a living somehow or another, farmers especially need to know how to do that in a really productive way. And how we can achieve high levels of carbon drawdown, potentially reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide down to 250 parts per million. That's below 350. We want to do that, right? Okay. And we could do it potentially over the next 30 years. Now we're going to think about how we're going to do that. Solutions. Okay, so why do we choose the name Cambia? Two reasons. The Cambia level uh, layer is the delicate tissue layer that is inside the bark of the tree, right? It's that inner uh, tissue that is where all the new cells are regenerated. So. We need regeneration, we need new stuff, we need new cells, so Cambia. But it's also the word for change, and I told you that Alejandra comes from the Latin, and I lived 32 years in Mexico and Latin America, and I just love the culture there and speak Spanish, and so Cambia, change. We need change if we're going to do this. So. 
there we go. The Cambia solution, what does it do? It fi helps fix climate change by increasing carbon drawdown by five times, reduces water use 50%, and at the same time, doubles farm income. We call that a rare, rare gem. Is that a good thing? Does that sound like a good thing? Can we yeah. consider? Yeah, are we awake? Yep. Yeah. No. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> what it does is it profoundly changes the operating system of how almonds are grown in California and deals with the three major issues of an industry, and many people don't know these statistics. The almond industry in California produces more than 84% of the world's almonds and almost 100% of the almonds sold in the United States. Did you know that? Some people, no, most people didn't know that. At the same time, we use 11%, just for the almond industry, 11% of all the water resources in the state of California are used by the almond industry, the way the almond industry is growing almonds today. 11%, that is enough water to provide water for the city of Los Angeles for three years, in one year, that's what we use, to irrigate these almonds that we're growing right now. We've got to make some changes, right? Okay. So this solution, we didn't just make this up. It's based on over two years of research. We got a $45,000 grant from the Lush Cosmetics Company, thanks to the young man back there, Gregory Landway, who is a Guy University master's graduate. And he wrote a book connected with the Lush Cosmetics co Company. He said, we got to do regenerative supply chains. He and Ethan, another graduate, and I'm very proud of them, sort of like their grandma. And uh, they said, well, you got to change the way in which almonds are grown in California. And they said, well, how do you do that? And Gregory said, well, I know a man lives in California Andrew Langford, co-founder of Guy University, he's the man to do that, to figure that out. And so for two years, for more than two years, Andrew was researching how to change the way we grow almonds in California, reducing water and increasing productivity. Our original plan was to work with the old abandoned trees. These were planted in the 1960s. They were planted on what was called bitter roots. These were not irrigated. Almonds all over the world are grown without irrigation. It's only in California that people have the bright idea that we can uh, take the water out of the mountains and we can dam it all up and then we can irrigate and use up 11% of the water in California to grow almonds that are being irrigated. Why? You know the answer to that? What's the answer? Money. Yeah, money, right? Fast growing, like racehorses. Fast growing, they plant them real close together, they soak up the water, they plant them actually, this is very interesting, they plant them on peach rootstocks. Andrew will tell you more about that if you're interested, but you know, when uh, peach and almonds are very closely connected biologically, some of you might know that, and peach rootstocks soak up tons of water, right? But the old almonds were grown on what were called bitter rootstocks. And there's still many of these trees. Those are uh, trees that were planted in the 60s. Some of them are still producing. So we thought we could bring back those trees. That was our first idea. Let's bring back all the old almond trees that are still producing. But we found that they were in such bad condition. They had been abandoned for so long that there was really it would be a, an uphill battle that we would lose. And that what we really needed to focus on was a technique for planting, new plantings and replantings that would be much more effective. So that's where we went uh, in that direction. And so we started what Andrew started to do, and that's Andrew over there. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's the other co-founder of Guy University and one of the partners in the Cambia Drawdown by Design. And um, what he decided to do was to develop some rootstocks that were, had characteristics that were comparable to the drought-hardy rootstocks that were previously used in the traditional way that 
almonds were grown. Second clear? Yeah? Okay, I want you to know I want to know you're with me, okay? So take your <laughs> Okay. So uh, oh, what happened here? Okay. So what we decided to do was to develop solutions that would integrate. Andrew's a permaculture designer. Okay, I'm gonna tell you about permaculture in a few minutes, but since 1985, so one of the old guys, right? So what he, we decided to do was to put together the classic permaculture techniques plus innovative per permaculture techniques and put them together with the drought hardy rootstocks and with this amazing fungal soil uh, techniques that I'm gonna tell you about in just a minute. And there's Dr. David Johnson and his beautiful wife, Wei Ching. Uh, who have been teaching us all about that. <coughs> Thank you also for coming. And just to, for those of you who don't know what permaculture is, so permaculture can be described as a system for designing that visions a permanent culture, okay? Permaculture, right? We say sometimes permaculture, restore the land, right? That makes sense? Okay, so it's embedded in an ethical framework. That's one of the things I love about permaculture. The ethical frame, anyone know what the ethics of permaculture here are? Yes, tell me. Equal share and fair and fair share. That's right, fair share or what I call the equitable distribution of resources, economy, right? We know that there is an inequality in the way resources are distributed on this planet, right? Anybody gonna argue my point? No. Yeah. Okay. So the Cambia solution though goes, yes, we're organic, but it goes beyond organics. And in a minute I'm gonna tell you why. And it combines the classic and the innovative permaculture techniques with the most cutting edge approaches to the creation of a fungal rich microbiome. That's where we get to soil, right? <laughs> so what happens when plant? Oh, oh, Andrew, next. Oh, oh, wait a second. Yeah, we did that one already, right? No. Oh, we didn't. Yeah, that's where we're up to. Okay, great. Okay. For those of you, uh, no, that's not where we're up to. Okay. So, when plant roots are combined with fungal roots, they explore much larger volumes of soil. Can you see that in the right-hand image? It's very clear, right? More soil volume means more moisture, more nutrients are gathered, and therefore a bigger increase in carbon drawdown because the plant brings down the carbon, Right, we know that plants give off oxygen and take in carbon dioxide from photosynthesis, right? We learned that in grade school, right? Brings it down into the roots, the root systems are bigger. You got more carbon in the roots, more carbon in the plants, more carbon that's kept in the soil. So, in addition, what we're doing is we're air pruning the seedling roots, that's a uh, process that happens in the nursery, it increases the number of roots by five times, and that completely magnifies the benefit of Cambia solution truths. Okay, so how do we create the fungal dominant soils? There is Dr. David Johnson smiling up there. <laughs> he's, he's shy. But, <laughs> We incorporated the scientific research of Dr. Elaine Ingham and Dr. David C. Johnson and his beautiful wife, Wei Chin, did I say it right? Okay. And we built an inexpensive farm scale bioreactor. You can see that up there. It's super easy and inexpensive to build. You can build it in your backyards. You can build it on any farm anywhere in the world. It is very easy, very inexpensive, local materials, great design. And what that does is with a static pile technique, it creates a fungal rich compost. Leave it nine months, don't touch it, 
give it a little water, keep it going. Ours has uh, frogs and some <laughs> mushrooms growing in it. It's very nice. Smells <laughs> like really earthy, right? It's all done. You take two handfuls of that compost. You put it into a compost tea brewer, or if you don't have a brewer, you mix it up with some water. One, two t handfuls over one acre will make significant difference in the fungal quality of your soil. You use it as an inoculant. It kickstarts the soil biology capable of drawdown, carbon drawdown, at a rate of 20 to 40 tons per acre per year. Now, let's compare that. Compare that with an annual loss. This is conventional agriculture. Conventional agriculture loses at least 1.7 tons per acre of soil carbon per year. And what about organics? Organics is good, but organics is only at best sequestering two to four tons per acre per year. And I'm in favor of organics, but we have to go beyond organics if we really want to get to the levels of carbon sequestration that we need to get down to 250. And I'm not saying this is the only thing we got to do, but it is definitely one of the things we've got to do. Okay. So based on trials in many parts of the world, Dr. Johnson, sitting there in that nice red shirt, <laughs> calculates that if just 20 to 30 percent of the world's soils were inoculated using these fungal rich compost teas, remember out of your bioreactor that you made in your backyard or that your farmer made and you used two handfuls and spread it out over an acre or through your vegetable garden, we could bring atmospheric carbon back down to 250 parts per million and that's pre-industrial levels. And Here's the kicker. Furthermore, his research shows increased crop yields of up to 40%. A major enticement of adoption for farmers, wouldn't you say? Increased crop yields? Are we awake? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> Are we getting this? Yeah. Are you with yeah. me? Okay. So, uh, we have 500 experimental trees. They have water-wise rootstocks, these rootstocks that are developed from the traditional ones. Not exactly the same ones, but based on the traditional ones. You can't get those traditional ones anymore. Nobody has them. No nursery. We went through every nursery in California because nobody is planting non-irrigated trees anymore, right? Except for us, right? So, and soon you. And we grafted them over with disease-resistant sweet varieties, and they're currently under the watchful eye of the chief horticulturist of Sierra Gold. Now, he doesn't, don't tell anyone, because he doesn't tell anyone. Sierra Gold doesn't really have that policy of dealing with the kind of varieties that we are, right? You ever hear of Sierra Gold? One of the three biggest nurseries, right? But anyway, he believes in what we're doing. So. This fall and next spring, our first combia-grown orchard will be planted on five acres at Full Belly Farm. Okay, and I think some people have heard of Full Belly Farm. So that'll be our first experimental orchard. We'll be putting in all those innovative and classic permaculture techniques. We'll be doing the, they already have 10 bioreactors going with the Johnson Sioux compost bio, fungal bioreactor. And we'll be helping design their fields in a new planting of five acres uh, with those 500 trees. So we vision Cambia as a successful, chaotic, eco-social enterprise that will support farmers through design and crop consulting services and with whom we will co-create the Cambia grown standard. So it will be a standard beyond organics. By supporting the direct marketing of the branded almonds produced, we will enable farmers to significantly increase their profitability. 
we will do revenue sharing with these farmers to provide income for Cambia as well as equipment hire. You can see an aerial harvesting machine there. This is a new way that they're using in Australia especially and in Italy to harvest so that the almonds don't have to touch the ground and you could even sell unpasteurized almonds. I don't know if you got to try some of Tim's almond butter. He has to bring in almonds from Spain because he sells unpasteurized almond butter. We could be producing that in California. And we will facilitate tax. We found out that farmers can get tax credits for experimental and innovative research techniques. So we will be approaching farmers and we're looking for land. Um, we ourselves have no access to land, but we're looking for at least five acre plots for people to start designing how we will help you design and uh, innovate with these techniques so that you can have your own Cambia Grown Orchard documented and we start to publish the results and then we start to demonstrate that this really does work and in California. So, um, repeat, the design and creation of a number of successful demonstration orchards is our next step along with the acquisition of sufficient funding to support the trialing, documentation, evolution, and widespread adoption of these techniques. We are not going to get to 20 to 30 percent of the world's soils unless we get going on trialing it, documenting, demonstrating, and showing that we can do it. We can do it. It's been done in other parts of the world, right, David? It's been done in other parts of the world, right? It's being done right now. It's being done, right? Okay. So, so considering the $11 billion revenue from California orchard production in 2006, that's a chunk of change, right? It's clear there is ample scope to accelerate carbon drawdown, support independent farmers, and support the creation of profitable eco-social enterprises. And almond orchards are just the beginning. These techniques are not just applicable to almonds, but they are applicable to probably any crop, but I will say at least David saying yes and preaching saying yes, maybe. We'll have to, we'll have to prove it, right? But uh, probably any crop, vegetables and other fruit trees and other nut trees and so on, would completely benefit from this combined approach. So who's doing this? We're gathering a stellar team from amongst our local colleagues and global networks. Our design and consulting team is led by Chief Permaculture Officer Andrew Langford. He is the co-founder of the Permaculture Association of Britain and has many other uh, credits to, in his backpack. And Kelly Rutten Jorgensen, who's sitting right here, uh, she is our soil scientist. She's worked with Dr. Elaine Ingham. How many of you have heard of Dr. Elaine Ingham? Um, she has studied with her and worked with Dr. Rutten Lal. Did I say it right? Rutten Lal. He is one of the world's so fam most famous soil scientists at the University of Ohio. And uh, Jorge Espinosa, he's from Honduras. He's a permaculture designer. He recently worked at the UCA Davis D Lab. He's an alumnus of the Zamorano Agricultural School and a master's candidate with Gaia University. We have a brand strategist, Julie Wilder. She's designing our marketing and social media presence. And Dr. Lee Kinger, uh, Klinger, he's an independent scientist and the principal of Sudden Oak Life. I don't know if you are aware of the issue around oak trees, right? Sudden oak death. Well, Dr. Klinger has, for the last 15 years, he has been saving about 10,000 oak trees by the traditional indigenous and permaculture techniques that he has been using. So uh, he's also one of our partners in doing this. And, well, as for me, I was an, act I was an activist in the 60s. And when the 70s came around, I decided I was no longer going to be an activist. I was going to be an actionist. And I was going to enact solutions to the world's problems, not just talk about it. 
not just rail against it. I was going to do something about it. So Enterprise has been my vehicle. I bootstrapped several enterprises, a women's sewing cooperative, of course with the women in a village in Mexico, and all the way to Guy University in its 11th year. And along the way, I've co-founded two Echo Village projects, one called Weiwei Coyotl in the mountains of Mexico, and La Caravana, a mobile Echo Village, activating and supporting alternative and indigenous movements throughout South America over 13 years. I lived in a tent in my 50s for seven years, <laughs> traveling through Latin America with a circus tent for 500 people and we did theater and uh, workshops and conferences and events and so on and in the process have had this ripple effect which is what it is all about really in each of our individual lives from my opinion we are as they as the lieutenant governor said if you were here he said he's one person with a staff of one person how much can he do how much can't he do if he creates a ripple effect and that's what Guy University is all about, and that's what the work that we need to do, each and every one of us. Okay, I won't let you, I'm sure you know. Okay, uh, so in my professional uh, outfit, I have served on the board of the Global Echo Village Network as its representatives to the United Nations, and I currently serve on the boards of the Global Village Institute and the Permaculture Institute of North America. So, as co-founders of Guy University, now in its 11th year, Andrew and I dance to the tune of older and bolder. We envision Guy University to spearhead the training programs needed to jumpstart the adoption of Cambia Solution and its techniques. So, we're coming to the end here. It's my belief that reversing climate, and I'm going to not say change, I'm going to say what Vandana Shiva very wisely said. This is not just change, this is chaos, climate chaos. Reversing climate chaos is the critical challenge of our generation. We have lots of them, but if we don't fix this one, the other ones won't really matter that much. So as our indigenous elders have taught us, with every action we must envision the effects on seven generations to come. Are you hearing me okay? Okay, great. So, in these times of transition, there's hope. This whole conference has been filled with hope, right? There's a doorway opening for great changes and working together, a thriving cambia, a thriving change lies on the other side. And so I thank you for your attention. There's more to this program, so don't go away. But please stand up and join us in singing a very simple song in Spanish called Cambia, Todo Cambia, Change, Everything Changes, and we'll give you the pitch. I told you this was going to be fun. Ready? Cambia, Todo Cambia. Cambia, Todo Cambia. Cambia todo cambia. Cambia todo cambia. You did that great, so let's do it again. Cambia todo cambia. Cambia todo cambia. Cambia todo cambia. Cambia todo cambia. We have a yes. Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> they won't mind staying a couple minutes more if we don't finish. <laughs> so we're going to take a few questions now. They can be addressed to you, Andrew. They can be addressed to me or to Kelly. And then Andrew's going to talk about the. No, we have until oh. six. Six. Okay. Okay. A couple of questions, quick. In the back. Okay. Um, my, one of my mother's high school chums in the valley owns a huge uh, almond orchard, and I'm wondering what the what would be the way to introduce him to this? What would the contact point? Could uh, us? 
could give us a contact and we'll make the contact through you. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, that's that's probably okay. worth knowing that, that people change out their almond trees once every 25 years or so. So they'll be doing that. So next time they change out their trees, they could be making contact with us and we could be converting them over to this kind of system. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. And the young lady? Just wondering what you're using for in your composting system. Are you, have you used, have you used, yeah, dairy manure for that? So, um, Andrew, you want to answer that one? What yeah, do we, we use? We used, a, we used a, uh, uh, like an early recipe. Uh, David have since been simplifying it, but we used a mixture of one third cow manure, one third wood chip, quite fine wood chip, and one third sort of leafy grassy material, all mixed together piled into the reactor uh, and uh, you know quite quite moist 60 percent moisture so you squeeze it and get some uh, moisture out of it and then uh, and then that's it you know you just keep it keep it moist what was it the first third I'm sorry the first third cow manure oh cow manure yeah, cow manure. yeah. yeah. Yes. but yeah. um uh, you can also speak with David because he's been experimenting with other techniques yes not keep the mixture on existing orchards that you just planted them, even though they don't have the right kind of root. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it, it would be that would be definitely a, uh, a, an experiment to be worth trying. I think that would uh, work quite well. Yeah, yeah, but you, the the drought tolerance will be uh, less there because of the peach, the the, the predominant peach roots. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and when the soil is moved, that's killing off the microorganisms that are also. I'll come back. To, oh, did you want to? Well, just curious. Uh, so, are these trees ultimately irrigated at all? I mean, I know it's typically the flood irrigation, but are these under drip or? Yeah, the probably micro sprinkler. Certainly, whilst they get established, and and probably because we're going to be grazing underneath too to make sure there's an adequate growth of uh, fodder for the livestock as well. But. We don't quite know what level the irrigation will go to, but we're aiming for between 18 to 24 inches a year. Yeah. We, ha we have Com some information compared to the on the table that gives you more details in the uh, most recent permaculture design magazine. Uh, we wrote an article for them, so there are copies of that. You're welcome to get that. And you, and then you, and then you. Yeah. Um, I live in Oregon, and I'm doing food shed modeling at the metropolitan level for the four metropolitan areas of the Willamette Valley region. And I'm just curious, you mentioned briefly about potentially expanding into other problems. There's a lot of perennials, a lot of fruit trees that are grown in the Willamette Valley. Is there, is it possible to kind of move into other types of perennials mm -hmm. or, and even with some of your experiments, are you interested in doing that or is it, are you trying to base it around the almond industry? Well, we started with almonds, but, uh, you know, the world needs this. So and what, are, what are some of the technical challenges, I guess, moving into other crops or other types of trees? You want to answer that? Uh, 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 we're expecting it to be quite straightforward to move to other perennial crops. So, so yes is the answer. I, I don't think it represents any significant technical challenges other than learning to work with, uh, uh, you know, maintain, maintain the soil quality and maintain the feed for the fungi as they're, as they're uh, uh, changing the quality of the soil. So once, kind of once, once each individual farm has learned how to do that, uh, I don't think there's a significant challenge to expanding out to different crops. And a, a key piece is for everyone to be documenting the work that they're doing, the experiments that they're doing, because that's the way that we can start to understand what works, what doesn't work. So if we know that it works in this condition and doesn't work as well as that condition and so on, we start to build a level of knowledge that then we can start writing, putting out papers and doing all the things uh, through Guy University that we and through David and Shane's work and so on, we can start to spread this knowledge. Okay, I think you were next. Oh, I was just going to say, I know one of the problems with conventional almonds is pollination and they have to bring bees in for this tiny window of time. Mm -hmm. And um, now they're starting to experiment with self-pollinated almonds, but it's not very successful. So I'm just wondering, um, this part of your system, I'm assuming, is looking at year-round bee habitat as part of the system. Mm -hmm. <coughs> One that one too? Yeah, that's that's right. We'll, yeah. be do, we'll be doing that, and we might also experiment with using this. There's two self-pollinating varieties on the market at the moment, uh, but they both yield much better if there's also pollinators around. So self-pollinators with good pollinating pollinator habitat is a better solution than um, to, to yeah. go for. So we we look at that too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, and I think uh, Actually, that was my question. That was your question, okay. This well, I have a question about the bioreactors. What methodology are they using? Are, are, is it sun that's turning into compost? Are they turned? How, how do these bioreactors work? Okay, so um, maybe David would like to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> These no, two are the inventors of that technique. There's no turning to it. It's, you know, that's the key to this. You create that fungal bond with compost. It's like a stack. Instead of, you know, most composting process, like window composting, they'll turn it for the first wave every day or twice a day. And you destroy it, that fungal hydro, the community destruction, and it's starting to grow up every time you turn it. So it's the stats of the But I also want to emphasize that. It's not just the microbes. The microbes are a kickstart to this system. It's supporting the microbes, the plants that grow with them. Yeah. And uh, the microbes are, are an important part, but the management yeah. and the growth of the plant on top of that soil is the key for all of its parts. Does that answer your question? So no turning. Yeah. Okay. And there's tons of more information about all of this. David has a whole series of videos on the internet. If you um, send me an email, I have cards up here. You can take my card. I'll send you the links to that. Or if you have David's information, you can get that from him um, because there's very clear instructions. That's how we figured it out. We just found David on the internet. Yeah. So this is your planning under story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Perennial. yeah, and that's, and this is part of the reason why we're looking at the aerial harvesting, mm -hmm. so that you can get the harvesting up off the ground, yeah. and therefore you don't have to have the clean, what they, you know, right. the clean orchard floor, mm -hmm. so that you can do the conventional shaking and sweeping to do the harvesting. So if you can get the harvesting off the ground, then you can have constant, you know, uh, uh, cover crop year year round. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to point out there's Tim, and Tim is the uh, genius behind Philosopher's Stone almond butter, and he's using unpasteurized almonds, and if we can start producing some of those with the aerial harvesting, all those techniques, he probably buy them from California instead of importing from Spain, right? Hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, I don't know, there's a certain amount of consternation in, among water people about the amount of tree crops being planted in the Central Valley because of the demand for water. And so even if it's reduced by 50%, that's still a tremendous amount of California water going to the tree crops, which require year-round irrigation rather than other kind of crops that aren't being irrigated all year long. So I don't know. I, I guess my concern would be, does this result in a net increase in the number of almonds being planted in the Central Valley? Like, would, would it be so amazing that even more people would be planting almonds? It's just that's where I go. <laughs> yeah. actually, I, actually, I think it will. It'll, it'll, it'll the, al the almond market right now, uh, almond uh, cropping, it's a bubble. Okay, it's a bubble which has been fed by large amounts of investment and so on and so forth. So we would expect that bubble to burst. Okay, but also one of the observations that we could make about California is vast quantities of water run out to the ocean every year because the way that the water storage is organized in California. It's organized around very large scale dams like Oroville and Shasta and Clear Lake and so on up in the north. Uh, and they only capture a part of the water which is coming off the mountains and the hills. And if we were to work at rehydrating the landscape by using check dams up in the hills and by using uh, 40 to 50 acre foot uh, earth dams in the uh, rolling hills and so on, there's large quantities of new water available in California okay so and, and, then, and, if we, and if we combine that with increased water holding capacity in the soils which we get from these fungally dominant um, soils there's big amounts of new water available okay so I don't think we at the, the if, you know we you know we're in the, we're at the, pla the we're at the place where the uh, current water infrastructure of California is close to the edge of collapse we saw the Oroville spillway this year, couldn't cope with the uh, um, flood waters and so on and so forth. Okay, now pretty much all of that infrastructure is over 60 years old and it's gone past itself by date. And we need very rapidly to be looking at this small scale, you know, thousands and thousands of small scale check downs in the hills with uh, uh, 
uh, lower level rolling hills, 48 foot dams and so on and so forth, in order to um, rehydrate. And one of the big advantages of doing that too is because you spread the water around all over the place, you could reduce the total temperature in the valley by up to 15 degrees by doing that kind of approach. Okay, so I, I, the, the issue is not that there's not enough water, the issue is that we're not capturing it in the right way and keeping it in the right places in order to feed the crops well. I'd like to add also that I, I think our, one of our objectives is increasing the resilience of, of, of the almond industry and agriculture in California. Um, and one way is by diversifying the, the strengths of different varieties of almonds. So we have um, what, what's going on with climate chaos really is an, like this whiplash effect where we have you know, super strong, super uh, unprecedented droughts and followed immediately by unprecedented flooding. And we need to be prepared in, 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 in producing food that is that, that increases the resilience, you know, so that, that some, some food is more able to um, do better in some conditions or and others. And I think another component to that, increasing the resiliency, is mm -hmm. having um, it's what our uh, objective is not just almonds, it's a uh, kind of a food forest, more of a polyculture. So mm -hmm. the um, almond orchards are not just going to be almonds, there will be other. Um, Varieties that are intercropped in there. Yeah. So and you said of grazing animals as well. Grazing yes. animals. Exactly. With, with still, so there's animals, and there's still only 50% of the water. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, this would not overtake the conventional almonds, at least in outproducing them, because the there is a a, a, a less lesser um, uh, yield in the almonds, but they're much more um, tasty and they're nutrient dense because they uh, have less, rely on less water.